Good evening. My name is John Barton. I'm the director of Stanford's Architectural Design Program. Welcome to the fifth lecture in our 2015 Architecture, Landscape, Architecture Spring Lecture Series. I want to thank Dave Lennox, the university architect, and Michelle Hagen and Zach Posner from his office for their leadership in organizing this series. We've been honored to have great speakers this spring. I'd also like to thank the American Institute of Architects uh, Santa Clara Valley chapter for their help in advertising the series and in registering the program for continuing education. I'm not sure the clipboard is here today, but if it is, you can sign up in the, the lobby for your CE credits. This is indeed a special night as it is, in addition to the fifth lecture, it is our third annual architectural design program graduation lecture. Designed to recognize our graduating class and our faculty, maybe the graduating seniors and the faculty could just stand up for a second. And we are delighted to be joined by Jeannie Gang as the graduation speaker. Jeannie Gang leads Studio Gang Architects, an architectural practice whose work has been noted for its innovation and been recognized as a design leader. Through exploration and research early in the design process, Ms. Gang's work has staked out new creative territory in materials, technology, and sustainability. The work of Studio Gang has received numerous awards, has been published and exhibited widely, and has been featured at the Internet, International Venice Biennale, the National Building Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago. Ms. Gang was chosen to lecture as one of the Architecture League of New York's Emerging Voices in the spring of 2006, and received an Academy Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in the same year. Her work includes a wide variety of culturally relevant building typologies, such as the Starlight Theater in Rockford, Illinois, the Kam Lu Building, uh, a community center in Chicago's Chinatown. Recent projects include the Wanda Vista Tower, which will be the third tallest building in Chicago, the Northerly Island Project, which charmed a lot of our students when we were in your office a couple summers ago, um, which re-envisions 90 acres of land in South Chicago, and the WMS Boathouse, which I think she's going to show. Jeannie's office has won numerous awards, and she was a recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship in 2011. Ms. Gang's practice includes a continuing commitment to architectural education as an adjunct professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology, which she has taught uh, until recently since 1998. She was visiting professor at Harvard in 2004, held the Louis I. Kahn Visiting Professor Chair at the Yale College of Architecture in 2005. And she's currently working with a stellar group of academics and professionals to help us design Stanford's new graduate program in architecture. Please give a warm Stanford welcome to Jeannie Gang. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. And it's such an honor to be here at such a special time when everyone's graduating um, and moving on to the architecture field. So tonight, um, I, I also want to recognize um, Claire Kayan and Greg Armisa from my office, who also came all the way out to attend the lecture. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about just the practice a, as a whole and um, how, how one defines a practice in architecture these days, um, working through some of our projects that are uh, more on the um, intimate scale of community and then moving into some of the taller buildings that we've done um, and with attention to materiality, to community, and to the idea of architecture as kind of an infrastructure for cities. And so our practice is now um, about 80 people strong. We have both offices in, in Chicago and now in New York as well. In our Chicago office, you can see here the second floor um, of this 1930s building in, in a very vibrant part of the city where you can um, you know, find just about anything, including a wig. Um, and um, and our, then the contrast is our new office in, in New York is actually on the um, lower east side near Wall Street. And um, a lot of new firms, creative firms, are, are inhabiting spaces that were left um, after 9-11. Um, and so there's a kind of a new energy there. I think one of, the, one of the things that defines our practice is really uh, starting out really looking at the local space of the city of Chicago where we, we started and, and thinking about the, the issues that impact our city. Um, most, you know, most people think of Chicago as this um, really the most American city, I guess, the birth of the skyscraper. Uh, and we certainly are participating in that downtown but I think what intrigued us very much from the very beginning 
was looking on these these outer areas around the city and, and learning about the natural history of the city. This is a, a view just of a, a space in the Calumet area where you can see um, this natural swampy land that, that really Chicago was built on had really, um, over the time uh, through industrialization, really be came uh, filled in many times, used as a dump. You can see the hill in the background is actually a landfill, not, not any actual natural landform. And so we, we've been intrigued with the potential of these kinds of places and um, the role of, the, the, uh, of, of nature and ecosystem services within a, a thriving urban center. And so, um, one, one project I'm going to start talking about tonight is really not a, a building per se, but more of a, of a research topic that has inspired our work and also uh, um, some of our buildings. Uh, many times we will have conversations about um, environment and community within our, within our office and sometimes inviting people from outside. Um, this was um, an actual, what we called an eco salon where um, we invited a lot of people in the um, environmental protection space in the city to come in and talk about projects. And the result of that was really a, a research project that ended in a book called Reverse Effect. So maybe some people might have heard that the Chica in Chicago, the, um, the, the, the Chicago River was actually reversed. And, and people like to point to that as a, such an incredible engineering feat. Um, and in fact, it, it actually was. It was about 26 miles of canal that were built in the 1890s, a huge infrastructure project that you would be very hard to duplicate today. Um, but it, what it do, did was essentially um, reverse the flow of the Chicago River um, as, as the river, river um, was being used to dump uh, pollutants and, and those pollutants were ending up in, the, in Lake Michigan, which is the source of drinking water. So the, the 26 miles of canals shown in red in this view um, were designed to take that flow and change it from going into the lake to, to going away from the lake, um, which was a brilliant idea in 1900. But then you know, today, as we see the, the effects of this over the last 100 years, we now see that uh, this reversal is contributing to a, a dead zone in the, in the Gulf of Mississippi and a lot of other detrimental effects um, that have come to light over the years. Um, so the, 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 the Eco Salon really uh, was finding out from our, uh, many of our partners, including um, those at the Natural Resource Defense Council that it is time to kind of reestablish a barrier and to reestablish these separate watersheds, uh, the Chicago River on the one hand and then uh, the Mississippi on the other, um, and, and take the opportunity to think about some other issues that impact our city and our, and our uh, water system. So it's a complex problem that involves transportation, um, the scale of the neighborhood, and, e and even in um, this issue of invasive species that are coming up uh, the Mississippi R River and threatening to make their way into the Great Lakes. And so I, as an architect, you know, it's, it's not really a building, but it is something that's very complex. It has scientific side and a, and a cultural side, and we felt that we could add to this conversation. Um, the, 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 invest, the invasive species that are coming are these carp that are, they were introduced into the Mississippi um, to actually to help deal with waste, they're filter feeders, but they proliferated and um, are making their way up. They like to jump out of the water when people uh, run their boat past them, so it's kind of scary. You can see this lady who's really like, you know, scared of the fish, some 80 pound fish jumping out of the water. But we also found that um, there were so these other problems like the, the flooding of basements with climate disruption. We have a lot more uh, water coming in quicker into the city um, and water quality is very bad. So uh, the potential though is really thinking about what to do along the riverfront in the city where um, a lot of the, the industry is kind of moving out and moving on. 
in many ways, I think we work similar to industrial designers uh, that that try to find out really the the facts about how problems impact people before we start jumping in with design. And so with this project, we really talked to a lot of the people that use the river today um, and what ways they use the river. And, and we also um, taught a, a studio. This was at, at Harvard in, in 2012. We did a studio to start thinking about what the barrier uh, could be. You know, it's, it's a barrier separating the watershed, but also a bridge potentially and other things. Um, so with all this research, we, we came to the conclusion that the, 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 the problem needed to be addressed in steps. And so it was a design problem to think of how the different steps could go toward renewing this waterway. Uh, so technical things, but also the idea of communicating this to the public uh, so that we could build some um, support for, for changing our use uh, of the river. And so the idea really was to to cut these, uh, to, to reestablish the barrier and to recycle our water. To, today, the water is like something like 2 billion gallons a day. No, this is like cringe factor when you're in California. 2 billion gallons a day we use just to flush like sewage down, down the river. It's, it's not used for any other purpose. And so there really needs to be this massive change about how, how the water is used. So we, we tried to help the public envision what this landscape could look like if it no longer is used in this um, industrial way, which is, 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 continues to decline. Uh, maybe new industries could come in, and, and that recycled water, after it's cleaned, could be put back into freshwater lagoons that could re be returned to the lake. Um, when we finished the book, uh, we did a lot of public outreach project, uh, with, with um, citizens to understand uh, these, these issues. And, and at the same time, there was a new mayor coming into the city, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who wanted to take the river and make that really a focal point of his, his um, um, mayorship and to, because he really liked the fact that it ran through neighborhoods as opposed to being this, this front represent, representational landscape. It's really more of a, of a community landscape. And so we, we were um, asked to, to actually think about um, how we might, as architects, intervene on, along the river. One of the interesting things is that the step number one in our book was really about suggesting that the city acquire former industrial property and increase public access because we felt that um, people wouldn't care about this waterway unless they had access to it. So in fact, this, this first project was all about public access to the river. Uh, there are four uh, boathouses that the city planned and, and we are in charge of two of them, one on the north side and one on the south side, um, which are for city youth, inner city youth, to use um, to engage this river, even though it's dirty, to, um, to start to use it as a recreational frontier. Um, it was a very fast project once, once we got going, um, about a year and a half from design start to, to opening day. Um, and this project is, it's a, Boathouse for the Park District, but it also it supports a couple of clubs that were already uh, using the river, um, and it allows them to up their game, I guess, and, and to, to compete on a larger scale. Um, there's a rec there's a field house that's inside the field house, and for practice in the winter and a, and a storage building. Um, so this was a very kind of minimal budget project. Um, but the, the results is amazing in terms of uh, how this project is serving the community. Uh, they have programs for disabled veterans to learn how to row, and they have children's programs and adult programs. But what I really like the best, I think, is, is seeing how the boathouse, which is on the lower right there, has really activated this um, industrial waterway in, in a completely new way. Um, and, and made it a focal point for all of these communities to, um, to engage it. And there's, many, there's a lot of real industrial parts of the river, um, but there's also a lot of ecolo a very strong um, ecological points. We used this 
motion of the oar in the water, uh, looking at the, the translation of that into kind of a roof form, uh, two different types of trusses um, with all straight elements in between uh, to create a kind of a, a warped uh, roof scape that, that captures that motion and energy of rowing. Um, this is during construction, and you can see the, the structure is very simple, just metal studs and wood, and then plywood stretched over those, those forms. So they have an indoor rowing tank for the winter, and here you can see kids uh, using it. But it just, it's so exciting to, for, for us to see this um, river come alive in this way um, and start to shift the focus from the lakefront over to uh, the riverfront. We, a lot of our projects are, are like this. There's a very strong attention to material and architecture, a love of architecture, I think. Um, but there's also a desire to do something good for our community. And, um, you know, trying to describe what that is, I think it, we're, we are idealists in a certain way, but we also want to see things get done. So we kind of nicknamed it actionable idealism because we, um, we really, we want to put our efforts towards things that are going to become architecture. I guess in a way this project fits under that category as well. It's, it's a nature boardwalk um, at the Lincoln Park Zoo. This is a, a, an early zoo in the, in the city of Chicago also. They had some, a historic building there in 1908. But the pond that you see in the foreground is really only a three foot deep reflecting pool. Um, and it was, um, this, this park district property was right adjacent to this free zoo that exists um, um, in Lincoln Park. And so the, the zoo leased the land from the park district for 50 years and wanted to improve the, the, um, the quality. It, it really had broken down over time and become kind of like a, a, a smelly pond with, with a broken edge. Um, and so we were asked to help reinvent that, what the pond would be. But they really, I guess they were really asking us to do some interesting architecture to draw people to this space. And in this case, we really helped to redefine what the program, what the problem was. Um, it's a view of how it's starting to look now. Um, but we realized that it was the pond health that was real, the real issue. Um, not just the fancy architecture, but it takes you know engineering to understand how this pond could do more. Um, we worked with hydrologists in this case to to understand what what was flowing into the pond, making it much deeper, which allows the water to be better quality and for fish to winter over in there. And so a, a huge part of the project was was really redefining what the the water body was and making it possible to hold storm water. Um, then architecture, it's so important to have something that people, attracts people to this space. Uh, we, we were really interested in using wood, uh, bent wood elements. These are laminated um, and bent in two directions, um, prefabricated stems that are um, added together to create a, a, a wooden structure with a, a kind of fiberglass cover over it so it could be used for educational purposes and, um, and for gatherings. And so this, this is some of the images of, of the building, really went up very fast, about five days um, for the pavilion to be constructed on site, whereas the pond probably took about you know, six months to, to um, dig out. But um, it's used for a lot of different things, including yoga classes and those kind of spontaneously started showing up there. Um, but then mostly like weddings is the main thing, especially architects who like to get married there. <laughs> um, and, um, <laughs> uh, but it's so amazing to have this real biodiversity uh, within the middle of the city, such an important um, piece of green infrastructure. And it's also working to contain the storm water. And so it's, it's an incredible space. It's gone from, there, were, there was a small rookery there with uh, f uh, 40 black crowned night herons, which were using it. 
um, for nesting, and that's the numbers increased to about 400 pair since we finished the project. And we also have coyotes, which I know you don't really like here in California, but we, we like them in Chicago. They help get rid of the rats. And uh, they're, they are, they've adapted to a, a very good, uh, to be a pretty helpful um, urban animal in the, in the city. So we're really cut, we're just interested in, in how closely these um, biodiverse nature and urban space can be intertwined. Um, this is a group, dance group using the pavilion as well. Um, so in doing these projects, I think it, it's, it's, as an architect, we got the opportunity to do a tall building um, in uh, 2004, a client came to us and asked us to design um, a skyscraper. And at, at first, it was um, it was kind of, you know, we had never done one before, and I didn't, didn't really know what to, quite to think about it, um, given their work is very, you know, community-based. But after, you know, starting to look at what's happening in cities, and obviously there's the population growth and growth of cities um, is a major concern, and element to work on for all architects. Um, I also felt that the housing issues are really a, a, an important part of the city itself. And, and going vertical is one way to address the needed density. You can see this view of Chicago, again, the hometown, um, sprawling way out beyond the uh, skyline with its approach to infrastructure as really thinking of infrastructure as roads and bridges and 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 which enabled this um, city to grow out without any um, without any containment um, and so we we thought that going vertical would really be a way to to help draw people into the city so in the same footprint of this Aqua Tower, which I'm going to show, um, um, you can, it, it, the land use is equivalent to about 333 acres. So you have 0.32 acres for the tower and is equivalent to about 333 acres with the same number of households on each. And if you look at the use patterns, you find that um, the suburban pattern really forces you to use about seven times more spend about seven times more carbon because of <clears throat> the way that you have to move um, every day for everything through the use of the car. And so um, a group that has studied this called the Center for Neighborhood Technology um, has measured that and found that in a typical um, suburb you're using that much more carbon per, per household than you would be in, a, in an equally dense building in the city. So that led us to design a tall residential building in the city of Chicago. And it was, it was really, this, this diagram shows the kind of growth of our different ideas for those buildings. Because after we finished the Aqua Tower, um, everything went on hold in 2008. We were still asked to design buildings, um, but, but none of those after uh, 2008 immediately got built. Uh, but we found that with tall buildings, they, they tended to have certain ideas that held them together. And so we've, we've mapped and tracked our own ideas and, and associated them. Um, and mo most of these strategies, I would call them, are ways to reduce energy or to cr increase the social aspects of living in tall buildings. These were some of the um, models that we um, developed. And these were shown in a, in a show that, that featured our work at the Art Institute of Chicago in, in uh, 2013. So this Aqua Tower is an 82-story tower. Um, and we, we started that project by thinking about um, the building more like a, a topography or a landscape that would have variation in it that could relate to specific things in the city, um, <clears throat> specific views. Um, between and around buildings. The site was very uh, surrounded by a lot of different buildings and, and there weren't like, it wasn't like perfect views all around. So we developed this in response to that. Um, and these, the topography really represents 
um, the extension of terraces for people's outdoor use off of the building facade. So these terraces, every, every really were made by the slabs, the floor slabs, extending out and, and giving people these different views and really generous outdoor spaces. The idea that you could really use uh, the outside facade of the tall building in a, in a social way within your own family, but also as a way to see other people um, who also live in that building. So a kind of a way to make eye contact, say hello, almost like over the, your back fence of your suburban yard, but bringing that quality into the tall building. Um, and so it, and it, it's really interesting because it, it opened in 2009. Um, it is a, it's an incredibly social building. A, a lot of peop, different people, um, empty nesters coming in, um, graduate students from the University of Chicago live there. <clears throat> and, it, and it really has been a very successful, you know, tall building um, from both the owner's perspective of, of selling units and renting units, but also I think from the people that live there. It, it was a building that also had a lot of work done around the ground plane to connect it to um, the outdoor spaces, including a big stair that we designed. Um, a podium that is active on all four sides with with um, retail and, uh, space, so there's there's no dead walls around it. And then it has a roof deck that you can see here um, that is also a pool and and social spaces. So besides the balconies, there's also other ways for people to interact on this tall building. Um, so after we finished that building, uh, one one of the goals we had for our next residential building, like I said, I think these are really the DNA of the city. So if, if you're an architect um, and you're, you're not working with any kind of residential building, I think in a way you're missing what, what is so crucial to the city. It, it's, it's really important how people live. Um, so we wanted to continue to do those, but we wanted to improve our, on our performance on the, on, on the slabs. Uh, the, the, the aqua tower that I showed you has these slabs that go from inside to outside. And in our climate there, there's heat loss through that. Um, we originally wanted to have those be thermally broken, but weren't able to accomplish that. So in our next design, we really wanted to address the issue of thermal, um, um, better thermal performance, but also, again, more social activity. So this, this is a building that's currently under construction called City Hyde Park. And it's really just, it's a, it's a rental building. Um, it's, it's a medium um, affordability rental building in, in Hyde Park, which is the place where University of Chicago is located. Um, and so this building, we, we really, again, working with structure, because I think structure is such a, a, it's such a good element to use for design and in tall buildings that you don't have very many things that you can work with. Here, here we designed um, a column that alternates back and forth. You can, it looks like a zipper and, and um, that zipper allows us to make bay, big bays that have no columns in the corner. Um, so that in, in the way this building had, it was facing north and south and we thought of it almost like um, it for uh, one side is kind of for more introverted people and one side is for more extroverted people. Um, and on the introverted side, you have the skyline to look at. And on the extroverted side, we made these balconies that just explode off the building. And so for the south side, they also provide sun shading. Um, they're almost like a stack. What, the, what I really like about this is they're, they're stacked columns, these panelized columns. And each one is a column, so it it can it, it takes its own gravity loads down to the ground and then ties back lightly to the to the building. So we're able to do a nice thorough thermal break on this building. Here's a little model that we made showing the the introverted side and and the extroverted side, and some of the rent renderings. Um, and now I, I, these are in construction photos, but I'm pretty excited because this was a kind of this sleeper project that, you know, it was waiting for so long to get financing and then suddenly it was under construction. So we're pretty excited. The, the first two levels are 
retail, um, like a Whole Foods and retail space, parking below, um, and then these um, building, these these rooms. This is the north facing um, apartments, and you can see the zipper going in there with with really amazing spaces with no columns inside. And now just starting, they're just starting to pull the um, scaffolding away from the in this stack of cards that are the, the, the balcony stems, which I think will be really dynamic in terms of their um, um, spatial qualities as well. Um, really exciting in, in this part of the city. Very simple and not an expensive project at all, um, just really addressing those kind of needs of, of living in the city. And I couldn't leave tonight without showing you the project we're doing in San Francisco. <laughs> Um, we're really excited to be working in this city. It's an amazing city. You can see our site right down there, the little blue dot. An amazing city for its nature and views, and it's just pretty gorgeous, let's say. <laughs> um, this is our site on Folsom Street. And what, unlike the, some of the, the other projects I, I showed, I think the students worked in a, this very close area to the site on their project, their, their senior projects. Um, and w one of the things is it's a, it's a really nice area with, which is well, well connected to transportation and walkability. I think it's even gonna get better that way. But the other interesting thing about it is the whole uh, site was pre-planned by the city of San Francisco. So they, after that bridge fell down in the last earthquake, they decided to trans Bay Authority to, to lay out what would be the future. So as an architect, we came in and it was already kind of like set up what we would be doing, um, um, and w including market rate units and below market rate units, um, a low part, a podium, a courtyard, and a tower. And so it it's kind of like, okay, now what can you do with that? Um, but what we, what we started to think about was just what makes San Francisco San Francisco and what makes it unique and how can we add to that dialogue. Um, we looked at a lot of these bay, these buildings with bay windows, beautiful um, old small buildings and also tall commercial buildings that, that took advantage of the bay window. And I guess the bay window is great because what you get is you get more views and more, more light than as, a composed, as compared to a flat window. Um, so we took this bay window idea and started to um, explore what benefits it could bring to to the uh, to the high-rise building for living. Um, you know, it could be a balcony that struts out. It could be windows that bring in light and air. Um, and there were just so many great views. We I guess we didn't know which one to respond to, so we started to to think about responding to different views throughout the height of the building. So this is just a series of plans, and if you notice the exterior of this envelope, you'll see it start changing from, this is the, uh, starting at the top, moving down to the bottom, so it's you know uh, 24 floors. You can see how each level, it kind of like morphs just a little bit, but the columns are staying in the same place. Um, and that produced this kind of rotating bay, you know, we call it a migrating bay that wraps around the corner, so, so the units won't be identical, they'll have slightly different views, um, and also it gives it kind of like a dynamic uh, use of, I guess, the, the bay window in a, in, in a tall building. So we're really excited about that, and it's, you know, slated for construction, starting construction later in the year, um, so really looking forward to that. Um, and one more tall building, well, just one that's currently on the boards in Chicago. Um, if you notice our work with tall buildings, a lot of times we're thinking of it more on the human scale, like starting with a smaller piece and adding that up, like with aqua, the slabs or the bay window, instead of starting with an outline, like um, something gestural, we're really starting with a, a building block, I guess, is the way I look at it. Um, here, the building block is um, what's described as a, a frustum shape. It's a, a truncated pyramid shape. And, and the reason why we started with that was just 
thinking about maybe we could alternate views between sky views and city views by, by flipping this thing upside down and, and, and also have different relationships to, um, to energy. Um, so um, by sloping it down, looking, looking uh, down at the city, you can get a little bit of uh, automatic sun shading. Um, and we started playing with those variables and also um, looking at what they would do if you put them um, next to each other, you start to see this uh, corners develop. So with a typical building like a slab tower, you get four corners, but we were, we were working with a smaller scale build, building block. We actually get eight corners on every floor. So that really helps the units too, because you get more, more views. Then we started to turn them you know, stack them up. This is one of the, the volumes. Um, and in doing this, we're starting to develop um, a, a lot of um, reducing the wind pressure by, by giving more surfaces and not having s uh, straight surfaces. These are all things we've learned over the years about doing the tall buildings. But the exciting thing uh, for us on this project was really that we, we have a site that actually has a long distant view for once. <laughs> Most of our projects are always like, um, you know, nested in the city. And this one, we called it the one mile axis, like from the Field Museum, looking straight north, you, you see this uh, building. It, it's, it's because it's located on a site where it used to be a road there. So from the south side, it really aligns with a, a long vista. On the north side, it takes part in this river wall. Um, and so those are two things that we considered. This would be the view from <clears throat> the south, so it's, su it's super aligned right with um, the Lakeshore Drive going north. Um, then when you zoom into the, the site itself, um, you see the, um, the one mile axis to the south, but you also see this, this problem of a bunch of infrastructure blocking between our site and the, and the river, those, those elevated roads. So, so one thing we really wanted to do was uh, um, like kind of reach, make the two parks reach each other and, and let this, tra this tower straddle over the, the connections, both on the upper level and the lower level. So the straddling action um, for the structure. Um, here's a section through, these are the, the elevated roads, and then here's us um, lifting up and, and and having the structure bridge over these um, these two areas, so it's it's challenging here. Um, but we're working with with the um, park district to also to kind of get those two parks closer together. And then the 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 form of the tower really came from trying to expand the number of green spaces on the roof, um, um, differentiating based on the the program. There's a hotel at the bottom and. And, and condominiums up at the top. This is the top section of the building, starting to look at how it goes together um, and really um, tweaking those, those proportions and, and getting it to, to work for both the pedestrian level and, and the overall form. So one, one thing we found out was that that trunk, that frustum form, when we have a smaller floor plate, uh, we have higher heat gain in the, in the space and, uh, versus the lar larger footprint. And so we used a, a gradient and the glass performance to um, ameliorate that. And you can see how this starts to really also emphasize the form, which is really interesting, kind of starting to look like this woven um, form um, and lapped glass. So uh, as John pointed out earlier, this, this is slated to be the third tallest building in Chicago, which it, honestly, we never really think about how tall it is. Uh, it, it, it just, because you almost can't control it until the end when you, when you know, you know exactly how many units are going to be there. But in this case, um, one of the, 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 the group, Wanda group who's financing the building really wants it to be the third tallest, so that's one of the rules. <laughs> um, so that, I think the, the, the issue of tall buildings, you know, and density, and making the city more dense is important. 
um, especially when you have the city that's sprawling out. But but I think it's time to also think about how to do that for um, in in communities. How do you uh, introduce height and more density even when you have maybe a low lying community and how can you do that sensitively? Um, this is a project that we uh, recently completed. Well, I guess it's ongoing. It's, it's an idea for um, um, introducing a live-work neighborhood into an inner ring suburb. Um, we were asked by MoMA to show this project. Um, they were doing a show called Foreclosed Rehousing the American Dream. And, and they, they really wanted to look at post post-economic um, crisis, um, is it time to rethink our, our um, idea about the American dream um, in light of the foreclosure crisis? And, and we, we decided we wanted to work on these inner ring suburbs, which are now kind of becoming uh, vacated um, because people are either moving further out or moving in. Um, so we picked a, a a suburb called Cicero, Illinois, and um, it's really on the edge of Chicago here, um, and it's literally right outside the city, and it had suffered a really high rate of foreclosure. Um, it's an older suburb, um, you can, but you know, it had a lot of bungalows in there, but they had a, something like a thousand and 55 foreclosures in the first year of the crisis and another thousand the next year. And so we wanted to look at that as a case study. So again, like this really has more to do with community and now like connecting those dots between what is an urban system, what is a sustainable urban system um, for a place like this. The original housing was for the nuclear family, but the way the housing, the bungalows were being used was really by dividing them up and having multiple families live in there for affordability. Um, we also found a way to interview people I and mean, it's a very sensitive topic about foreclosure, um, but we, we talked to people who had experienced that and found out that um, the main reason for their foreclosure the, was really because of the loss of jobs and a lot of the people that live there really worked like two and three jobs. Um, but and when they lost those jobs, they um, were foreclosed upon. Cicero is a place of immigration, originally from places like Lithuania and Poland, and, and then most recently these three states in Mexico coming directly into Cicero. So that was kind of a um, you know, different situation than the typical city in America where the city center is a place of um, new arrivals. And here um, we have new arrivals coming directly to the suburbs. And there is just not enough, there's not enough services to help people get started. At one point, this, this place had factories that employed this particular one, 40,000 people in one factory. But those jobs just, you know, are totally gone. Um, and, and the housing that was built for the nuclear family, as I said, is kind of, um, Re being redefined um, as multifamily housing. So you can see some of the, so the, basically it's, it's a place that has lost all of these factory jobs. Many of them have been, the factories are, are um, tear, torn down and then paved over and become kind of car oriented strip malls like here. Um, people just not having any, um, any, any opportunity, I guess, for um, that kind of work. So the first step was really mapping, mapping what the problem, what the problem was. I mean, the foreclosed homes. You can see these are literally the ones that were foreclosed. The um, industry being foreclosed, and then you have the on top of that industrial era contamination on those sites, and so it really sounds like a bleak picture for for this type of inner ring suburb. So in light of that, we we thought. Let's try to think about the housing first and, and, and what to do with the factory. So if the, if the bungalows were designed for a 20th century family and now we have different family structure, maybe we could take apart uh, the bungalow program and start to think about how it can be 
um, reshuffled to address a different structure of family. So we thought there could be shared things because the, the families that come now, sometimes you'll have um, several relatives coming for two or three months or maybe even a year before moving on. Sometimes you have unrelated adults living together. So there could be opportunities for sharing certain parts of the home, uh, community spaces, etc. cetera. Um, so our, our concept was to, to make a building where you could re, uh, it would be flexible so it could respond to these changing family structure. Maybe you could add on bedrooms and still have it connected into the same apartment. And so we took the factory itself and, and tried to address its issues. Um, we found out that really with phytoremediation, like for a, not all the factories, but some of them, you could kind of rip off the roofs and start this process of cleaning them with using plants to clean the, the industrial era soils. And in about four or five years, they would be ready for reconstruction. And also looked at you know what mining the materials of the building, how much materials are there that could be reused. So this is where we started to say, how do you introduce some density to this uh, space and also provide space for live and work? Because um, a lot of people would be working out of their home, but in the suburb here in Cicero, it's actually illegal to do so. So we wanted to introduce a new model. Um, maybe the uh, green space or common space could tie up through the vertical um, cores and then uh, units that would be designed to be flexible so they could be added together or, or, or separated based on families. Um, and anyway, it's kind of like this, I know, like a mushroom growing out of the factory. Um, so introducing the idea of multiculture as opposed to the past 20th century monoculture where you had industry, recreation, and housing, now we have all those things interwoven together and really exciting way to um, use resources. Once you get a critical mass of people and creating the community, you can start to um, use the resources to benefit, like using waste to produce energy, for example. Um, we needed an economic model. We, we were working with an economist on this, um, and we needed to figure out how it would work financially and also legally. So with, with the zoning, we had to kind of re, de, well, you know, redact the, the zoning code to make it possible. Um, and then we, we also had to come up with, with um, an idea about finances. So this just shows a little bit what our thinking was in terms of zoning. Um, we, we currently have this separation between living and working even though it's very close together, but we wanted to integrate it. Um, and then the idea that there would be open spaces for markets and living and working spaces. The ownership model is, is based on an LEC, a limited equity cooperative. Um, and so you would create a kind of a trust um, that would own the infrastructure of the site and then people could own their individual homes. Um, the, the red could be places that people would be able to, um, to own. And because they're smaller, uh, they would be affordable. So typically, we have private ownership of the land and the streets and the electric is government. Um, but this would be different in that this co-op would own the, the infrastructure and then the individual units would be smaller. So you'd always have a ready buyer, too, if you had to move for your job or something like that. So this whole concept really took place about like starting to heal the factory, basically, starting to settle. It's a process. It's not a, a solution that happens overnight. Um, but little by little, you could start to breathe new life into this inner ring suburb and eventually connect it uh, to all the rest of the city. Um, we're really excited about actually testing this project. We've, we've talked with several uh, cities, planners, who are interested in testing the LEC model. 
Um, and we think that it could be a way to address some of the issues of affordability that we see right now and inequity in communities. And then ultimately we're showing it connected to the, the alleyways in Cicero, which could become much more um, lively if they were allowed to be used for living and working and selling. Okay, so finally I just want to show you a, a project that really kind of speaks to those ideas of, of um, community. Um, it's a small, it's a college building in Kalamazoo for Kalamazoo College um, called the Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership. And this is a project that we finished last October. And um, I really like the scale of project two because I feel like it could, it, it's, um, it's something that can work on a, the scale of the, the college campus, but also the scale of Kalamazoo, but have kind of a more global impact in terms of what they're doing inside. Um, this is the campus, Kalamazoo College. Um, it's surrounded by a lot of, of, of neighborhood here. Um, um, and it's, it's a very small liberal arts college that has a very strong program in social justice. So students um, in their senior year, they, they actually go out, they design a program, um, whether it's about human rights or um, LGBT issues. They, they, they actually do their program um, one semester away and then come back to the college. Um, the campus is a little bit, it's, it's, some parts are very beautiful, some parts are kind of fake uh, colonial, <laughs> um, but, but it, it's, it's got a, a cohesiveness. The only thing about the, the college campus was really that um, this idea of the neo-colonial architecture didn't really fit very well with the idea of social justice. And um, <laughs> so we, we were trying to make it connect in some ways and, and depart in others. Um, one of the interesting things I think maybe most interesting on this project was there wasn't really a precedent for a building designed for social justice from scratch. I mean, social justice happens. It happens in the street, you know, when people are demonstrating. Um, we were really interested in, at the time we were starting this design, it was um, the time of these large Tahrir Square demonstrations where people were really creating communities organically without architecture. But, but the, this was an image from CNN where you could see all the different parts of the community from prayer areas to sleeping areas, um, food. Um, so there was kind of this interest in, in wanting to have a very kind of open street aspect to it. Um, but what the students are doing inside this building uh, and with the faculty is sometimes they're, they're planning and strategizing about, so it's, it's the step that comes before this. Um, and that is a, a time when social justice is very hidden. I always think about um, Martin Luther King who was planning a lot of demonstrations in the basement of this church in, in Birmingham. Um, it happens in kitchen around a kitchen table or it happens in basements. Um, if you look worldwide, there are kind of buildings that you could say are for justice. Uh, these are community spaces um, um, that usually surround water or, or a fire hearth, um, places where people can meet. So we looked at a lot of that too. So on our site though, um, we saw that there w it was connected to this kind of gr green grove and we thought that would be a very good element, contextual element to, to connect the building to. It also had uh, a relationship to the neighborhood, the Green Grove, and also the campus. So we wanted this kind of transparency to show what's going on in the building um, um, in these three axes. Connecting those axes are these gently arcing walls that, that also create outdoor space. This is kind of an earlier sketch uh, that you can see it's starting to take shape, um, the trifoil-like plan. Uh, where you can see the, 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 the ends of this, this Y intersection are, are 
pointing out to these different views. So, but inside the building, it's possible to open up and have the whole thing work more like a street. And so um, and we, we kind of stepped the interior so that there could be big events in there or, or smaller, more intimate events. At the center is this hearth uh, where students can um, gather around. And another thing that we heard from people was this, just like the idea of food preparation is really good in a space to help break down some of those barriers between people and, and make it uh, really possible to, to communicate. These are just some of the drawings and models used to plan the building. Now it came to the masonry, like what do you do as an architect? You have this you know, brick campus. Um, we thought masonry was a good idea, but we really you know, wanted it to be sustainable. We started to realize there's, there's a potential for um, the use of wood. I, I, we always really like using wood as a renewable resource. Uh, here they had this white cedar, which is resistant to um, rot and to insects. Um, and it's also sustainably harvested there. But then at one of the site visits, um, uh, when it, the project architect kind of came upon this building, which is a, a barn, um, and we noticed that the barn has um, wood and used as masonry on it. Um, kind of a, a long forgotten technique, but it was used in Michigan for a while. And um, we found out that there was one surviving person that could still knew how to use this. Um, and he was basically doing, you know, backwoods saunas and things like that. So we, we asked him to come and teach us how it's done and also teach our contractor who were already on board. Um, the college really liked the idea of using, reviving this technique, um, a kind of a heritage technique. Uh, this is our, our studio doing, learning the, the technique. Um, basically, you get all the insulation from the wood, um, and it's used just like brick. There's mortar in between. Um, you put a, a line of sawdust down the middle of the, the, the wall to give the thermal break. And then we thought, wow, this, this is really something that, you know, our work is very contemporary, but, but here's something that is really relevant for now because of uh, climate and the need for embodying you know, carbon instead of space. Uh, putting it into the atmosphere. We tested a lot of different like aesthetics to, to see how we could you know, bring it up to the 21st century, also in, in the, the way of making it. Um, but I think everybody really liked the connection between the individual, you know, every log is different, every tree is different, you know, based on how much water they had when they were growing up and, and um, the climate, and every person is different. And so there's just a great connection with this material. And then we pushed it and to try to do new things with this technique um, um, and, and essentially had to buy this wood like a year ahead and have it dry out very slowly. Um, so once we you know, got our client to love this as much as we did, we, we bought the wood so there was no going back <laughs> after that. Um, uh, but what's really cool is, you know, it is, like I said, it embodies carbon, so you're really, compared to a brick wall, you're holding, you're sequestering the carbon inside the wood, because you're really not doing much to the wood oil, not so much processing and so on. So it basically, it's, it's, it's like, you know, taking 10 cars off the road, just building the walls, um, as opposed to putting that into the atmosphere. We finished, like I said, last October. Um, and the school is now in, in operation. Um, I'm just going to show you some pretty pictures, I guess, to end us all. Um, um, but so the building lands differently on, on the different um, ends. This is, one, this is entry from campus, and um, this is the window that goes out to the grove, and this end kind of cantilevers over as it, as it um, addresses the college. This is... Um, the campus entry, and you can see the wood there. We used um, some circular openings, which the masons had to, you know, do the final placement. Inside is really super bright, and we have a clerestory lighting and very light colors. Different kinds of meeting rooms around in the space. 
Um, this is the entry from the neighborhood side or the, the city side, the community side. Um, and you come in and the hearth is at the center, um, the, the kitchen, and then these different um, meeting rooms of different sizes. This is a little coat locker space in the entry. Um, this is inside the, the office area for faculty. But essentially it's a new building type to address social justice. Um, here, here's the main space set up for a small lecture. Um, it, it's really quite accommodating for many different things um, in the lot. Some of the, some of the areas are smaller spaces for, for work. And here's the uh, seminar room with, a, with this eyebrow window, we call it, or, um, that you can see through. You can see the, the wall there. So it has been used already for a conference on social justice. So it's really great. Um, and this is just the building in all the different sides. Uh, and so with that, um, I want to thank you again for inviting me. And um, congratulations again to the seniors. Um, I'm happy to take a few questions if, if, um, if you want. So thanks. <laughs> I, I have a sort of two-part question. One, um, can you talk about why you use models in designing your buildings and why that's an important part of your process? And sort of connected to that, how do you, I mean, models now for noted architects like yourself are becoming commodified, so museums want to collect them, maybe collectors want to collect them, so... Does that change the way you work with models? Mm. And then finally, um, sort of thinking about the, the models and related to, it seems like you use them more maybe on large buildings. How do you see your place in sort of the history of the skyscraper in Chicago? I mean, it's such a, such a key building for Chicago. And I mean, you're not, you're doing two of them now. And as you okay. said, the third tallest building in Chicago, and it's such a historic and iconic structure for that city. Where, where do you see yourself mm. fitting in, or do you think about it that way? So if you can answer those two. Okay. Um, well, uh, the first part's easier. <laughs> With the models, we, we use those really iter iteratively through the design process, even though, you know, obviously you got modeling going on digitally all the time, and with every possible tool that we can get our hands on. But with physical modeling, I think one, one thing we've done is try to uh, like replicate, or, or not replicate, but mimic maybe how the, the building might be constructed. So if there's something innovative about material, like if it's um, cast material, we'll, we'll try casting with the model or um, with with bent wood, we'll we'll find a material that can actually be be bent instead of just printing everything, you know, three D printing everything. Um, so we're using it also as a communication tool within our office. Um, sometimes I feel like if it's only being modeled digitally, you, you just you're not you can't see from every angle, and you also don't have the ability to. Um, chain, you know, to, to get around in a group and like break something off, you know, the model, which is so important. Um, so we're using it as a design tool and, and I'm, you know, I would, if somebody wanted to buy our models, I have, we think we have a whole entire basement full of them. So if some collectors wanted to, um, uh, we might be able to sell some, but no, we haven't, we don't really, didn't change our process with that in mind um, with the idea that they are objects that to be collected. We, we're trying to preserve them, but a lot, most of the time we're trying to preserve them for our own use, you know, um, for other projects or for, for understanding something. And then I think just in terms of the role with, within Chicago, it's pretty hard to say as, you know, as you are in it, like what 
where you are standing in relation to those giants of Chicago architecture, like Mies van der Rohe and Louis Sullivan, and 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 um, the and people like Helmut Jan. I mean, everybody that's done those buildings. I think we, I I think we have a a unique approach to it, but obviously we are working within the context of all of those buildings. The structure is so important, and I think that that carries over into our work, definitely by by looking at um, those predecessors. So I mean, too early to say, but but I, I do feel that there is uh, a kind of a dialogue across the years between the buildings. Um, and we feel like, I guess, we feel like we're, we're part of that conversation. Hi. Hi. Uh, obviously, in, in all of architecture, um, we run into the economics and politics that surrounds architecture and getting buildings built. Um, so my question is, uh, what have you experienced with uh, economics and politics in architecture, and what would be your advice um, going, being involved in those things in your work? Um, advice for, for like someone like you, or advice to the profession, or to, to the profession. To the profession. Oh. Yeah, because I think it's, it's true, like, Obviously, architecture is a tool of power. I mean, it costs a lot of money to do a, a building, and um, and so it's it it can be used that way. Um, I think if you, if your approach, if you're trying to change the status quo, and I do, I would say that's exactly what we are trying to do. Um, it's it's important to to work outside your own just studio and, and to work with others that are in the community or um, um, experts in other fields besides your own so that cross-disciplinary, but even beyond cross-disciplinary, like um, um, if you're trying to, to have an impact on a city, it, it's important to understand what, what those forces are that are gonna be working against you and what ones could be harnessed to work for you. So I, I think it's super important. I would say it's very important to understand the economics and the politics, um, not to be just simply focused on that, but, but for, because it's important to know where you want to go. I think that's the most important thing. It's like what, what, defining what you want to do and then figuring out a way how to do it instead of, instead of just figuring out what all the, you know, the, the, the forces are and trying to get embedded within that. I think it's... It's really important to have a point of view, and it maybe it takes years before you you really get that, so it can be clearly articulated. Um, but it becomes clear, and then then you know what you have to do to get that built. Last question down here. To just follow up on your answer. With these eco salons, do you have other disciplines that visit your office and that you collaborate with? And also, is there always um, an end result that you have in mind, or do things come out of those salons mm. that mm. just develop naturally? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I think it's it's not always just in a in a salon setting. It could have, could be also just the different types of people that you maybe have a conversation with or do a project together um, where ideas do organically come out of that. It's, it's um, for example, um, understanding um, with the reverse effect, understanding that, um, a, that the environmental community was really starting to get behind separating these watersheds again. Like, you, you have to be in the situation where you can have that conversation before we knew that we were going to, you know, address that or write a book about that. I think it happened literally at the end of that salon. We were all sit sitting around looking at Google Earth and talking about the river and, and then um, learned that the NRDC uh, was thinking of 
putting a, you know, reestablishing this barrier in this one spot. And so then it, it kind of, you know, just something like that really piques your imagination, like, you want to what? Like, you know, separate these waters again after all? So, so that started it like, wow, this is really a big idea. Let's work together with them and bring in others to, to start it, sorting out what does it mean for the city? What does it mean architecturally? So it could be very accidental, but you also have to be purposeful in putting yourself and your team in, in a situation where they can listen to other people outside of our own. Uh, world. Great. Thank you all very, very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>